So I just wanted to share a little bit about this next session. Um, this next session is called How Digital Health Saved My Life. Uh, we did it for the first time last year. And I want, I, selfishly, I wanted to hear what was going on from the patient's point of view. And I wanted to hear about real life, uh, just real life stories, what's going on. And um, it, it was really impactful. It was truly impactful last year. And uh, I mean, not all of them, you know, have to be tearjerker stories for them to be impactful, but they do need to but they do need to be stories that ultimately have changed someone's lives and um, in some situations actually saved their lives. So uh, this year um, we have a, a, a really great, uh, a great lineup. We kind of do these in, in little vignettes. And so uh, once I introduce the first, uh, the first individual, uh, they'll be coming up on stage individually to share their stories with you. So um, I hope you enjoy it as much as I, and some of these are, are, are the first time that we'll, we'll all be seeing them. So uh, we have a, a really special family that flew in just for this, two special families that flew in for this. So um, is Adam ready to go? Just wanna double check. Is Adam ready to go? I just wanna double check. Okay, thanks, sorry, <laughs> I can't see. <laughs> Look over my right shoulder. So I wanna introduce you to Adam. Uh, Adam. Jackson, who is the CEO of Doctor on Demand, and uh, he, he, his New Year's resolution is to bring video telemedicine into the mainstream. So uh, he's here, here to share a very special story with you. Hey everybody, I'm Adam Jackson, co-founder and CEO of Doctor on Demand. Um, thanks for having me, it's great to be here. Uh, Two years ago when we started Doctor on Demand, I didn't know much about healthcare. I, I, don't, I don't think I know much even now after doing this for two years, but what I did know was that it was hard to get into the doctor, it's hard to get an appointment, and when you do get an appointment, it's a pain to go in when you're feeling bad and, and you know it's nothing serious and it's a, a non-emergency medical condition. Um, and if you can't get an appointment, then you're stuck going in urgent care and you're sitting for five or six hours with a lot of sick people. I just knew there had to be a better way. So. Um, I teamed up with Dr. Phil uh, and his son Jay McGraw and we built Doctor on Demand a couple years ago and launched it publicly in uh, 46 states uh, about a year ago. And um, basically, very simply, you download the app or an iOS, uh, Android, or you can use this on the web. Go to DoctorOnDemand.com. You create an account. You tell us what's wrong, tell us your symptoms, give us a little bit of prior medical history. And within a few minutes, you're instantly connected to a board-certified physician who's licensed in your state. So one of our, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we treat lots of kind of normal sinus infection, allergies, flu, that sort of thing. Um, but as with any other primary care practice, uh, sometimes something that looks normal can actually turn out to be a little more complicated and lead to uh, a really extraordinary conclusion and sometimes a life-changing one. So in this case, uh, we have Alexandra from Chicago who's going to tell us about her uh, life-changing experience with Doctor On Demand. Hi, Alexandra. Is the audio all set? Yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. How are you guys? Doing great. Thank you. You want to tell us about your uh, your story with Doctor On Demand? Yeah, that sounds good. My name's Alexandra. I live outside of Chicago. Basically, I have a condition called endometriosis, and it's a female gynecological condition that requires a lot of you know doctor visits. And um, I've been on a lot of medications throughout the years. Unfortunately, they uh, prevented me from being able to get pregnant. So when I was 16, I was diagnosed. Obviously, I wasn't, you know, looking to be pregnant at 16, but obviously I wanted to find out my options as I got older. And uh, three months ago, it started when I heard about the app, actually, from a friend, and uh, I gave it a try. I was connected with a Dr. Alba, and I told her that I was experiencing some uh, bladder infection symptoms. And she suggested um, a supplement, a cranberry supplement that can be taken over the counter that actually um, saved me a lot of money and time. I was taking a prescription medication and I'm able to get away with taking something over the counter now instead of having to take a prescription. So Alexandra, <laughs> oops. <laughs> Thanks, Todd. <laughs> Oh no, did we lose her? 
<laughs> oh. All right, this should reconnect us here in a second. Here we go. So this is the good news is, if you're using Dr. On Demand, you get an incoming call, decline the call, restart the app, and you're back. <laughs> See, that was rehearsed. Oh, thank you. You're too kind. <laughs> Alexandra, I'm sorry about that. We, uh, we got an incoming call on, uh, on our phone here, and it, and it cut us off. No, it's but, okay. But um, do you want to tell us that kind of the last really uh, super interesting part of this story that, that was uh, life-changing? Yeah, actually, I found out about a month ago that I was pregnant, and I'm now nine weeks along, and I'm really excited. My fiancé and I are hoping to have a boy. Awesome. Well, congratulations. And kind of the, uh, the in-between part, a little round of applause for Alexandra as she's pregnant now. <laughs> you, you see everybody here? Don't, don't get nervous. There's only a few hundred people here. Um, the, uh, so, so kind of the, the, the middle part of that story, I'll, I'll paraphrase because I know we're on a time schedule. Um, so Alexandra was on some medications that um, were actually inhibiting her from being able to become pregnant. The doctor on a man physician was able to give her some advice, switch her to some over-the-counter things, and voila, she's able to get pregnant. So lots of, uh, lots of uh, more complex medical uh, b below that, but uh, it's great to be able to uh, use a doctor right on your phone. And, um, yeah. Uh, and sometimes uh, something that you think is, uh, is simple uh, can actually be more complex. So thanks so much for being with us, Alexandra, and congratulations. No problem. Thank you. All right. So um, with my, my last couple of seconds here, I will, here, I'll turn that off so Todd can call us back. Um, so you might be wondering, you know, who are these doctors? So, okay, I got the Doctor on Demand app. Um, what do I do now? You know, am I, uh, who am I going to get on the other line? So we use board certified physicians. They're family practice doctors. I'd love to sh just play a really quick video from one of our actual full-time doctors who uh, actually gave up his own practice and now works with us full-time. You have that video? I, I can voice over for him. Hi, I'm Dr. James Gibbs. <laughs> I wish that were the audio of this video. Oh, man. <laughs> Aren't these more fun when they're a disaster? <laughs> there we go. I've been a family physician for 30 years in a multitude of settings, private office setting, clinic setting, as well as a medical director for larger health plans. My gut was this was kind of the forefront of, of medicine where people seek care out of convenience and, and by necessity. I really wanted to participate in that. I've been a physician for a little over 20 years. What I particularly enjoy in my experience with Doctor on Demand is we're able to provide access to excellent board certified doctors to people across all of the United States. They tell us that they haven't had those opportunities to access very good care and especially so easy. Hi. I've been treating patients over the phone for 30 years, and uh, the opportunity to do so with the addition of a camera video seems like a definite improvement. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for calling Doctor On Demand. All right. All with 15 seconds left. How do you like that? Thanks, everybody, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Todd Cole. My name is Nancy Loazzo, and I think I would have rather phoned in than stood here in front of all of you. Um, I'd like to share my story of living with a hearing impaired spouse. Those who know me would say I am not a quiet, soft spoken person. They may even say, Nancy, please use your inside voice. But my husband was continually asking me to repeat myself. The first thing I noticed was Dick withdrawing from social situations. When invited to dinner, especially to a restaurant or any place with crosstalk or background noise, he didn't want to go because he wouldn't be able to hear what people were saying. Or he wanted to choose the restaurant based on the noise level rather than the menu or the ambiance. Another difficult area was watching TV or listening to music. He'd turn up the volume so loud, I wanted to scream for him to turn it down. Since he couldn't hear at a level that was good for me, I had to give in to a louder volume than I was comfortable with. The third area that was difficult was much closer to my heart. That involved family get-togethers. 
We have four fun-loving, outgoing children. And when we get together with their spouses and our 13 grandchildren, the commotion and noise were overwhelming to Dick. It was all noise with no understanding. He'd want to withdraw, or sometimes during the conversations, he'd have kind of a blank look on his face or an in inappropriate smile that I knew meant he had no idea what was just said. About a year ago, Dick got his ReSound Lynx hearing aids. Okay, that's the product placement. Um, and I saw a significant improvement. Needless to say, I'm very grateful for the profound positive impact in each of the above areas since Dick got his ReSound Lynx hearing aids. Thank you. And I'm Dick, the hearing impaired husband. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you about the professional side of the impact of hear impairing on our life, since you've just heard about the social and the family impact. Uh, I'm a consultant. And as a consultant, you need to be able to hear what people are saying. You need to be able to hear the inflections of what they're saying. And yet, as a consultant, I often don't control the environment with which I'm doing business. And you can do business in a lot of very challenging environments. For example, a lot of my business is in restaurants where the ambient noise is very high and there's usually music blaring. And I would find myself leaning over the table, straining to hear, asking people to repeat themselves. Now, I had some of the best hearing aids in the world and I was still in danger of losing my career because of my hearing impairment. Another place where it showed up is I'd be in a conference room with a long conference table. My hearing loss is the high frequencies, and invariably a soft-spoken woman would sit at the other end of the conference table, and I couldn't hear what she was saying. And there's no way to hide that. The third place it showed up was as a consultant. A lot of the work I do is on the telephone, and cell phones are amazing. But they also have connectivity issues, don't they? They can also be hard to understand sometimes. And I'd be juggling the volume on my hearing aid and the juggling on my phone, trying to get the right balance. And sometimes I just tell people, you know, I'm going to have to call you back in a minute. And then I'd try and find a landline, or I would try and find a quieter environment so I could actually do business on the phone. Couldn't do business at all on the car phone. I'd spend two hours, three hours in the car, and I could not do it because even though I had excellent hearing aids, every hearing aid amplifies the road noise just as much as it amplifies the telephone. And I just gave up trying to do business on the phone. And in addition to all those communication issues, there's just a stigma of hearing impairment. Because as I'm working in those challenging environments and I'm working with clients, I'm pressing buttons on the hearing aid, trying to listen to the number of beeps and figure which program I'm in, or trying to find out the volume. And I'm concentrating on the beeps and trying to talk to them at the same time. Uh, for a while, I used a transmitter around my neck, but I found when people, I met clients for the first time, they'd say, well, what's that thing? And it immediately drew attention to my hearing impairment that I was actually trying to draw attention away from. So for all of these reasons, I was in danger of losing my entire career. In fact, I had a meeting with a client, and halfway through the meeting at the restaurant, he said, Dick, it's obvious you've got some hearing impairment. I'm not sure we can use you. So when I heard from my friends at ReSound that they were developing a new technology where I could control my hearing aid from the smartphone, I said, I don't even have an iPhone, but I'll buy one to get that technology. I've been using the ReSound links for about a year now. And like my wife has said, it's, it's been life changing. Let me back up and just put it in context with each of the problems that I had. In a restaurant, I can adjust the volume, the program, the bass and treble, on my iPhone, I can look you in the eye and be talking to you and making connection changes, and you don't know I'm working on my hearing aids. I was in a business meeting, and there was a nightclub next door. And it's the kind of environment where everybody was leaning to each other and they were shouting. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? I just took out, I put it on restaurant, which directed a narrow bandwidth on my forward microphones. Then I shut off the microphone on the side of the room the band was on and turned it up on the other side. Then I went to bass and treble and I shut off the bass so I wasn't getting the booming sound. 
And my wife that was sitting next to me said, oh my goodness, you're understanding other people better than I am. She calls it hearing aid envy because I can hear in some situations better than she can. What about that soft-spoken person at the end of the conference room? Well, there's a feature in the ReSound links that turns your iPhone into a directional microphone. You just tap that, I put it on the conference table, aim it toward the person, and it's a directional microphone that can pick them up from a distance. Perhaps the biggest impact was on telephone usage. I have never been able to not handle a cell phone call in the last year, including in the car. And the reason for that is the ReSound Lynx has a Bluetooth connection to stream my phone. I hear it in my hearing aid. I'm not hearing it from speakers in the car or someplace else. My telephone call goes to my hearing aid. It's crisp, it's clear, it's in my head, and I can adjust the volume from this. And that was a game changer, and that was a life changer. Now, what about the inherent impairment stigma? Well, um, because I'm changing it on an iPhone, you don't know that I'm actually adjusting hearing aids. And because they're so small, most people don't even see them. I've worked with people for many weeks, and they had no idea that I had hearing aids. So I'm here to say that the digital changes in hearing aid control, especially the ReSound links, saved my career, and it's given me back the quality of life. And I encourage anyone with hearing impairment to do the research and move and get a product. Thank you. I feel like we're in a great meeting here. My name is Jamie Rupert, and a year ago I suffered a concussion. I was a strategic communications executive, busy, 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 got a concussion, was diagnosed at the hospital in the emergency room. They did a CT scan because my symptoms were so severe, I couldn't, I couldn't open my eyes, I wasn't speaking well. They were afraid there was bleeding. The CT scan came back fine. They said, go home, go see a neurologist. I went home and saw a neurologist, and he had an MRI done for me. And the next week I went and I sat with him and he took me through my MRI. Has anybody been through their MRI of their brain? I have no idea what it said. I had no idea what it meant. I trusted yeah. that he said, yeah. your brain is clear. You have a concussion. What you need to do is go home and wait it out. I couldn't sleep. I, my memory was awful. I had no ability to go out. I was absolutely went from a very vibrant person to somebody who was very happy to be on the couch, not watch TV, not read, do nothing. When I was told, go home and wait it out, there's nothing we can do, I just couldn't take that as an answer. And as life goes, I ended up talking with some very good friends who said, hey, we know of this new brain technology. And actually, the guys that are doing the research and working on it are just down the road. So my next call was not to a doctor. My next call was to a technology group. And so I'd like to introduce to you Brian Hickson, who is one of the lead, lead guys of the group, who actually um, helped me see my brain in a way that not only could I heal my brain, my life is far better today than I ever dreamed it could be. Thank you, Jamie. All right, well, I'm excited to be here today. When it comes to our health, we measure everything that's important to us. We measure our blood, we measure our heart, we measure our weight and height. We even, as we saw before, measure all the steps we take every single day. But when it comes to the command center of our body, we completely ignore actively measuring the health of our brain. I'm going to show you a technology here today that not only transformed Jamie's quality of life, but actually has the ability to empower everybody in this room to take control of their brain health and to maximize their full human potential. Your brain drives your body. And we finally have the ability to drive the brain. The foundation of the technology is built on over 30 years of neuroimaging studies actually looking at the brain, on over 60 peer-reviewed studies and publications, on the world's largest database of brain scans that relate to behavior, 
Our team is comprised of some of the top minds in the military, in medicine, in technology, and performance. In fact, we have uh, one of the top experts in mental resiliency and performance with the U.S. Army here today. Uh, it's my partner, Dr. Daniel Johnson. You heard Jamie talk about that after her concussion, she had an MRI and a CT scan and they were normal. Every person in this room knows the difference between a computer hardware and computer software. It's the same thing with the brain. CT scan and MRI measure the, the brain's hardware. It measures the structural anatomy, the, the, the physiology of the brain. But the problem is, as everybody knows, most computer problems happen in the software side. And that software side doesn't necessarily show up in the hardware. What we do is measure the brain's activity. We use EEG technology to actually understand the efficiency of how one area of the brain communicates with the other area, to actually look at the electrical communication going on in the brain. This technology is based on using sensors to actually measure that electrical activity. It's no different than what a stethoscope does to measure your heart. The beauty of the technology is that it's non-invasive. It can be about 15-minute scan. It can be done anywhere. Now I'm going to show you what Jamie's brain map looked like. <laughs> so we take the EEG and translate it into a brain map. Now brain map shows us three things. It shows us areas of the brain that are underactive, areas of the brain that are overactive, and the areas that are in the middle and optimally functioning. As you can see in Jamie's scan here, she has areas that are in bright red, that are over three standard deviations of high activity. This is significantly overactive activity that can definitely cause problems with everyday function from those areas of the brain. Now, the interesting thing is when I went over this brain map with Jamie, she said that's the exact area of her impact and her injury. What our company has done is we have focused on translating to transform the complexities of EEG technology and deliver it in a consumer-based, personalized, and measurable platform that literally allows an individual to take control of their brain health, that gives them the information that they can understand and have an, a meaningful and actionable way to change their brain health. This is so important to actually be able to see it, to be able to track it, this literally, these items there on the screen that we measure are what can take an executive to the next level. It's what can help a school child excel at school and understand learning in whole new ways. It's what can help us empower us to literally preserve our cognitive performance as we age. Now with Jamie's brain, you can see a before and after. You can see the decrease in red. She still has a little bit of an area there that, that we're working on and continuing to do that. But even though her symptoms are gone, we're still working on improving that, and optimizing the brain and getting it to the full place it was before. Now, a medical doctor may be able to look at the EEGs, the before and after, and, and, and gain some information out of that. But to Jamie, this information below is her journey. This is where she can track her focus, her memory, her social, emotional wellness, things like sleep and energy, performance, stress management. These are things that are going to make a difference in her life today, and they're meaningful to her. Now, to make these differences, we know that all these things listed here have excellent ability to change brain health. But the problem is, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Not every one of these things will work with every single person. So literally being able to track what works for you, what's not working for you, and improve your brain based on measurable activities is so important. This is the first time we've actually linked all these activities to actually a measurable outcome in brain health. This transforms things like fitness and nutrition to actually optimizing a brain-body experience. For Jamie, not only did it change the quality of her life today, which is hugely improved, but it's also altered the trajectory of her performance as she ages. Small changes in the brain and optimizing that performance today when you're young 
even up into your 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, can literally make significant differences as we age. Our number one crisis in our society today is not all these things listed. Our research has shown us that poor brain activity is at the core of every one of those things. It is essential that we measure the brain, that we quantify those improvements and track it. It's the only way to improve it. And this, is, this technology is allowing us to be able to truly drive the brain since the brain drives the body. We're going to have to Thank wrap you. this up. Thank you. Perfect. Hello, everyone. My name is Ray Dorsey. I'm a neurologist at the University of Rochester, and I care for individuals with Parkinson's disease. And before I get started, I'd like to just ask how many people know or know someone who has or had Parkinson's disease? Wow. Uh, so uh, uh, Parkinson's disease is a uh, prototypical uh, chronic condition, and chronic conditions, as most of you know, uh, affect 140 million Americans and account for over 75% of uh, health care expenditures. And Parkinson's disease is associated with aging, it's associated with higher costs, and individuals live long periods of time, on average 14 years with the condition. It's characterized by arrest tremor, uh, slowness of movement, and difficulty walking or difficulty with balance. And a number of uh, high-profile individuals either have or had uh, a Parkinson's disease. And for the last seven years, my colleagues and I have been using temple, uh, telemedicine, simple web-based video conferencing, to care for individuals with Parkinson's disease initially in nursing homes and more recently directly in their home. And the reason we're doing this is because a large number of individuals with Parkinson's disease can access care. So even though Parkinson's disease generally affects older individuals who have Medicare and therefore have universal health insurance, 42% of Medicare beneficiaries with Parkinson's disease do not see a neurologist. So this is a, a map from one of my colleagues, Dr. Allison Willis, and you can see that if you live in northern Nevada, 7,500% uh, of individuals with Parkinson's disease aren't seeing a neurologist, but even on the eastern shore of the United States, 25 to 50% of individuals with Parkinson's disease aren't seeing a neurologist. And it turns out that individuals who don't see a neurologist are 20% more likely to fracture their hip, 20% more likely to be placed in a skilled nursing facility, and 20% more likely to die. So how can we use technology to overcome distance and disability to increase access to care for individuals with a Parkinson's disease? Uh, so my colleagues and I conducted a small uh, randomized controlled trial in which we took 20 individuals with Parkinson's disease who were seeing us in clinic and randomized half of them to come to continue to see us in clinic uh, as they would uh, in practice. Or the other half would see us directly in their home. So we give them a virtual house call. We would connect to a grandma with Parkinson's disease directly in their home. And we sought to answer three questions. Uh, first, are we crazy? Uh, can we connect to grandma with Parkinson's disease directly in her home? Uh, second is, can we provide comparable care remotely to the care that we provide in person? And third, is there any value uh, to providing care directly in the home? On the first question, are we crazy, it turned out more of the visits, over 90% of the visits conducted in the home were completed as scheduled. And actually, one person uh, coming in to see us in clinic actually got in a car accident uh, on their way in to see us. On um, the second question, it turns out that measures of quality of life and measures of Parkinson's disease symptoms, uh, the clinical outcomes were comparable, small study, but it appeared that there were uh, no significant differences. But on the third one, uh, to Kevin Maney's point, we, we really flipped the care paradigm. We asked patients to time themselves from the time they left their home to see us in clinic to the time they returned and individuals were spending 255 minutes, over four hours, to spend 30 minutes with us in clinic. By contrast, we asked patients from the time they turn their computer on to the time they can turn their computer off for a virtual visit to time that, and that was 53 minutes, and they were spending three quarters of that time with us. So each virtual visit was saving uh, patients and their caregivers 100 miles of travel and three hours of time uh, per visit. So I want to tell you this, share with you the story of one of my patients, uh, Dr. W. Dr. W lives in, as a physician, uh, he works in nursing homes and actually cares for individuals with Parkinson's disease. But he resides in a small town called New Hartford, New York, about population 20,000, which is outside of Utica, New York, 
which is outside of Syracuse, New York, which is about 90 miles from Rochester, New York, where I, I practice. And about six years ago, he developed some early signs and symptoms of Parkinson's disease. But after six months of trying to receive care <clears throat> locally in his own community, a physician, he couldn't receive uh, care. So he drove two and a half hours to see me in Rochester, New York. We diagnosed him with Parkinson's disease. We recommended some exercises and some medications. And he's done very well. But instead of coming back to see us every time, he's been seeing us first uh, remotely in a nursing home where we've been providing care to individuals with Parkinson's disease. And about three years ago, he transitioned to seeing us directly from his home. So we went from a two and a half hour commute uh, to come see me in person to a 10 minute commute to go to a local nursing home to receive care virtually to a zero minute commute to seeing uh, us uh, directly in their home. And in the future, I imagine that he, he would probably be eager to do a mobile uh, telemedicine visit, maybe through Doctors on Demand, to make his life even more convenient. And I asked him if I could share his story with you today, and he said the following, I would be honored if you would tell my story. The most recent addition includes continuing to practice essentially full-time in skilled nursing facilities while shepherding eight sheep and fixing a, a frost-free hydrant, which was freezing up not uncommon in upstate New York, and threatening to force a daily water transport by hand. Farming bends my back, but clears my head. And while Dr. Wilcox, Dr. W is, a, is an exception, we hope to make him the rule. If you think about the history of medicine, the care you receive is largely dictated by two factors. The first was who you are. Were you the right age? Were you the right sex? Were you the right color? Were you the right creed? Were you the right character? And the second is, is where you live. Did you live near where you could access care? And we're trying to, with the advances in technology in the 21st century, we're trying to bring that chapter to an end and to begin a new chapter, whereby using technology, we can enable anyone, anywhere, to receive care. And just, we're trying to do that right now. If you have individuals who have a Parkinson's disease and are looking to participate in a research study, we're doing a national randomized controlled trial of telemedicine for Parkinson's disease. We hope that the results of this will not only bring us one step closer to enabling anyone anywhere with Parkinson's disease to receive the care that they need, but to do so for a wide range of other chronic conditions. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Christopher Yopst. I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon at Nemours Children's Hospital in Orlando, Florida. I'm the director of the Limb Lengthening and Limb Reconstruction Center there. And we've heard a bunch of really amazing stories and I'm about to tell you another amazing story. How many of you out there knew that I could make you taller? Do you know that surgeons can actually make people taller? This is the same woman in both images just before and after having her limbs lengthened. Did you know that's possible to correct limb length discrepancies? So this girl is standing on four centimeters of blocks underneath her right foot because her left leg is longer than the right leg. And if we take an x-ray of her standing up, you can see that her left hip is higher than the right hip by four centimeters. And after a surgery to lengthen her femur, you can see that her pelvis is level, her leg lengths are equalized. So how can we lengthen a bone? How can we correct a limb length discrepancy? Well, surgeons have been doing this actually since the 1950s using a device that we call an external fixator. These fixators come in different sizes and shapes, but they all use the same concept. Basically, we attach the frame to the patient's bone using wires or screws. They pass through the skin and soft tissues to the outside of the body. And then after surgically breaking the bone, we can actually gradually lengthen the bone and make it longer, and that allows us to make the leg lengths equal. As you can imagine, having this device attached to the outside of your body is awkward, it's uncomfortable, it's generally a nuisance. And although my patients smile to be in the pictures with me, I never had anybody come up to me and say, that was such an awesome experience, could you please do it to me again? <laughs> so we're always looking for better ways to do it, and I'm happy to announce that we have a way to now lengthen your bone all from the inside using this device, using the power of magnets. This is the precise nail. This is the actual device. It's been on the market since 2011 and it now allows surgeons to perform safe, accurate lengthenings all from inside the bone. 
I've been using this magical implant for about the past three years, and I'd like to introduce you to one of my patients. Madison is a, si a sixth grader. She's 11 years old from South Florida. She was born with a congenital femoral deficiency. When I first met her, she had a two inch leg length difference with her right leg longer than the left. We actually diagnosed her ourselves, both my wife and I. We actually showed our pediatrician, we said, hey, look, uh, one leg is different than the other. One leg is just shorter than the other. So he looked and he thought, oh, maybe there's a little bit of a hip issue that happens with normal uh, babies. And then he's like, nope, you're right. And that's when the process started. Well, I mean, 11 years we've been waiting for this day, what, you know, surgery she was gonna have, what doctor we were gonna choose, and that it's finally here, it's just, it's amazing. Like, the relief that, I mean, we feel is incredible. Hopefully in a few months she'll be standing up cheering and uh, doing her cheerleading. And hopefully maybe play some softball after Christmas. What do you think about that? Yes. So just a few uh, <clears throat> parts about the hardware, the nail itself. So it consists of two telescoping rods that can lengthen up to 80 millimeters, which is a little bit more than three inches. It contains a magnet inside, which is actually what drives the whole system. And that magnet is connected to an internal gear system. So if we could actually look inside the nail with a microscope, you'll see these parts inside. And basically what happens is the magnet rotates and then through the gear system it actually creates distraction of the nail which makes the bone longer. Once the implant is inside the patient, there's an external remote controller that actually allows them to continue the lengthening process. And that external remote controller has two magnets in it that actually grab the magnet inside the patient and spin it and allow the distraction to occur. Basically what happens is the patient self-treats themselves three or four times a day depending on the doctor's recommendations. Each treatment takes anywhere from a minute to a minute and a half. And within seven minutes of total treatment time, we can lengthen their bone one millimeter per day. It comes in a kit, so this ERC comes with a monitor. The monitor actually displays how much the lengthening is occurring and it automatically shuts it off at the end of the uh, treatment. And there's a little animation that we can play which just kind of shows you a visual of how that would work. And so the magnetic field from the monitor outside the patient grabs the magnet inside the rod and spins it and that causes the bone to distract. And then because bone is living tissue, it just gradually fills in and heals by itself and over a few months, the bone is filled in longer and normal. So let's see how Madison did with her surgery that she had this summer when she got the precise nail implanted. I am thrilled. We've been waiting since she was born. We actually diagnosed her ourselves, both my wife and I. We said, hey, look, uh, one leg is different than the other. One leg is just shorter than the other. Well, I mean, 11 years we've been waiting for this day that it's finally here. It's just, it's amazing. So the way the surgery works is that we actually make a very small incision and then create a surgical fracture of the bone. The nail is inserted inside the bone and then the nail actually has the capacity to slowly lengthen the bone and make it longer. Touches forward and then do a little hop. And so about a week after the surgery, we teach the patient how to use this device. The device is placed on the limb. There's a magnet inside the rod and there's a magnet inside the device and they communicate with each other. And that allows the nail to actually slowly lengthen. So I'm gonna turn on the machine. It's absolutely not gonna hurt, but it is gonna make a lot of noise. I don't feel anything, it's just heavy. Well, right here, the kneecaps, this one was like always up here. He said she looks outstanding. The bone's growing, you know, starting to grow in nicely. There's no knee problems. There's no hip problems. Hello, young lady. How are you? Hello. Hi. Eventually, we should be able to tell the new bone from the old bone. Now that you're down to one crutch, are you excited? Yeah. Now I can walk up the stairs. Hopefully we come with one crutch and leave with no crutch. <laughs> no pain. Like, feels great. You want to get rid of that crutch? Yes. 
Madison was an ideal case. She was very vigilant with her physical therapy. She did her exercises every day at home. She maintained her knee motion and her hip motion perfect the whole time. And therefore, we were able to keep lengthening until we achieved the goal without having to stop. Uh, Madison is off crutches. Her bone has filled in perfectly. It's strong. She just let go of the crutch and just walked. Yeah. It's amazing. It's like she always knew what to do. Today we are here so my daughter Madison can leave her crutches at St. Lazaro Shrine. If another person needs them, they can use them and then when they're done with it, they can pass it on to whoever needs them. It's amazing. There's, you know, I, words can't describe how I feel. I feel very happy and relieved that I don't have to walk with a limp anymore and now I can walk normal and I can be more normal in my life. It never fails to tug at my heart to see how these kids just transform themselves and get them back to running and jumping and being a happy normal kid again is, is really very gratifying. Remarkable. So these are x-rays of another patient, but basically they just outline a typical distraction and then uh, healing of the bone. And you can see that this patient got three and a half centimeters of length just in about three months of healing time. So in summary, this precise nail is a major breakthrough in limb lengthening. It allows accurate lengthening to be done all from the inside. No external frames are needed. It's minimally invasive surgery, so it basically takes three to four small incisions for us to do this type of surgery. It's remarkably painless, so it's a tremendous improvement in patient comfort and satisfaction compared to the old method. There are several sizes available so that we can put it in children as young as nine or 10 years of age. And the clinical results with this have been amazing, and uh, the healing response has been very accurate and very healthy. But don't take my word for it. I'd like to introduce you to Madison, her parents, Nancy and Robert, and her sister, Caitlin. This is Madison. She has a precise nail in her finger. So first of all, thank you for coming all this way. And I would just like to start off, uh, Madison, if you could tell us, it's been about six months since your surgery. Tell us how things are going. Well, I feel great, and now I can walk normally, and I can run normally, and I don't have to walk with a limp anymore, so I just feel amazing. That's amazing. And mom and dad, if you don't mind, uh, what changes have you noticed in Madison since the surgery? The biggest change that we have noticed is obviously the way that she walks. For her whole life, she's walked with a limp. Her feet, her left foot was never flat on the floor. She always had to wear a lift in her shoe. And since the surgery, she walks her normal. Her legs are straight, her feet are flat on the floor, and she doesn't need to wear a lift anymore in any of her shoes. I mean, the most amazing part is she still has the nail in her, and you wouldn't even know it. But the lengthening is all done, and uh, this summer we'll be taking it out. But now, the one thing I don't have to worry about is she doesn't have to tell me, Dad, I can't wear these shoes that all these girls are wearing because she always had to have special shoes. Now, with both legs being even, and she can wear any kind of shoe she wants, high heels, low heels, flats, sandals, whatever she wants. And if you women know, Shoes are a very important part of your life. I have, my whole life is women, so that's all I know. <laughs> Madison, do you mind to share with everyone what was the worst part of the whole process for you? Well, the worst part I thought before the surgery was going to be the surgery because I thought it was going to be really painful and I thought I was going to have the worst summer ever and I thought I was going to be very miserable. But when I actually had the surgery, it, I had no pain at all, and it, was, it wasn't actually that bad. But the worst part, I think, was waiting to get rid of the crutches because it felt like I had them forever, and I just couldn't wait to start walking again. 
So I understand that you did something special with your crutches. Let's see what, what Madison did with her crutches. Today we are here so my daughter Madison can leave her crutches at St. Lazaro Shrine. If another person needs them, they can use them. And then when they're done with it, they can pass it on to whoever needs them. We chose this shrine because he is known in Cuba to create miracles and give people miracles to walk again. And they pray to St. Lazaro to maybe do a miracle and make a procedure or whatever they had to help them walk. I feel very happy and relieved that I don't have to walk with a limp anymore and now I can walk normal and I can be more normal in my life. You know, I see the result, of course, I have to say it's, it's amazing. There's, you know, I, words can't describe how I feel. You want the best for your kids and this is it. It's a fantastic thing that you did. I'm really proud of you. So uh, just to summarize and finish up here, um, we'd like to use this technology to help other children like Madison at our center and attract kids from around the globe to Orlando and help in our International Limb Lengthening and Limb Reconstruction Center. And thank you, and if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you.